my church family. Thank you, Danny. And thanks to all the musicians. I was blessed. Were you blessed? Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, we're transitioning now to another phase of our time of worship to God, and that is to study His Word, reflect on what it says and how that applies in our lives. And so we are going to continue our sermon series, Truth Link. You should have a study guide in your bulletin. I hope you're taking advantage of these and reading these. These are really good study guides, and I want to give you a little heads up. This is a good one this week, very good, good one, but the next one, next week, wow, next week is really, really good, okay? So be here for that one. I'm actually a little bit jealous because uh, I would love to be here presenting that, but I'll be in Tennessee next week, and Pastor Ridge is going to be presenting that one. But we've gone through it. He knows the material well. It's going to be a great study, so uh, you're in for a real treat, hopefully today and tomorrow. You will be in for both times. All, All of these are good studies. They really are good. So the image of God. Now, we just prayed uh, in a general sense, but, you know, my heart was touched when my daughter prayed for me. Did you catch that when she prayed? Help it to be a good sermon. I'm sure a lot of you are going, amen, help it to be a good sermon. I got I, I to gotta listen to this for some time. <laughs> It'd be good. So I want it to be good, too. Let's pray. <laughs> Father in heaven, you know, when we talk about these deeply spiritual things, it's so important, Father, and we all have a carnal nature it's easy to not appreciate sacred things and value them as we should, Lord. And so I pray for clarity of my heart and mind to be able to present clearly. I pray for those out here listening, those listening online. I just pray, Father, for us to receive a blessing from you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And thank you, Lord, because we will. Amen. All right, the image of God. So the Bible starts out with this uh, these words right here, this, this sentence, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That's how the whole book starts. Now, if you believe that statement, you are a theist, believe in God, where we get the term theology. If you disbelieve that statement, or at least the part about God's existence, then you are an atheist, do not believe there is a God. So these are the two competing worldviews today. I understand there's a lot of subgroups and a lot of different views, agnosticism, atheism, and different forms of theism and so on. But just roughly speaking, if we really boil it down to its simplest form, we are either theist or atheist, one of the two. Now, most people, this may be kind of a shocking statement to you, but I think it's absolutely true. Most people are theists. About 90% of people actually believe in God in, in the United States, different in different countries. Most people are theists of some form, but live like atheists. Let that sink in for a minute. So what does it mean to live like an atheist? What do you think? What do you think that would mean? Just, just, just using your own head. Yeah, like, like you believe in God, but for your daily life that has no real functional relevance to one's daily life, okay? That would be living like an atheist. So like I said, most people will say they believe in God, but I think that there's a lot of those people, and I was one of them for many years. You may have been one of them, too, at some time, maybe one of them today, where you say, yeah, I believe in God, but uh, anyway, you know, I'm busy with other things. Okay, that's where most people are. Now, the term for this is cognitive dissonance. (coughs) Cognitive dissonance exists when people have ideas or behaviors that just don't align with their overall worldview. So you can say, I believe this, but I also believe this. Those two contradict each other. Or I believe this, and I do this, and and that's cognitive dissonance. Now, we all have some of it to some extent. I'll I'll, I'll be clear with you. I'll be honest and transparent with you about an area where I have some cognitive dissonance. I believe that it is good to go to bed early and get plenty of sleep. I just think that's a good thing to do. How many of you agree with that? Right, it's really good, right, to go to bed early and get plenty of sleep. Nobody says, you know what, I really think it's good to get, like, you know, go sleep deprived. That's, that's the way to live your life. Now, but do you sometimes stay up later than you should, knowing you should go to bed, but you're engaged in something that's interesting, or you just don't feel like doing it even though you know you should, right? We all have probably done that. That's a form of cognitive dissonance, where you believe one thing, but you're really not doing it. So... Really, living a life of 
personal integrity, I think, is, is recognizing this cognitive dissonance that we all have and striving to narrow the gap. Because there's a gap between, with all of us, of what we actually believe we should do, what we believe is true, and how we actually live. Jesus was the perfect example of someone with no cognitive dissonance. What he believed, he lived 100%. All the rest of us, there's going to be some levels of gap. And so uh, the better off we are in life, the better off we are able to close that distance between what we believe and what we actually do, the better off you know, we're going to be. So we might have sort of minor forms of cognitive dissonance, like I described, you know, I stay up a little bit later than I should. But sometimes we can have major forms of cognitive dissonance, right, which is I'm, I, I don't have to give you examples. You have, you're intelligent people. You can think of what they could be. But a lot of people that are essentially living like a life, I believe in God, but then living a life where that's not relevant, that's a pretty big issue. That, that's more than just, you know, I should probably get eight hours instead of seven hours of sleep each night. Now, this is an important issue because cognitive dissonance is a significant contributor to mental health problems. You know, if you have a, if you ever get studied uh, depression, there's a great uh, program out there. It's Neil Nedley's Depression Recovery Program. You can go through this online. Uh, we did this years ago at a church I was at, and I've actually been discussing doing it here too. It's a great program. It's helped a lot of people because instead of treating mental health problems like depression just with, with medication, it's actually treating the causes, not just the symptoms. And as a side note, there's, no, there's not much money in treating the causes of health problems. There's a lot of money in treating the symptoms of health problems. Okay? Pharma, the pharmaceutical industry and the whole medical industry makes a ton of money treating symptoms of physical health problems and mental health problems and all kinds of problems. It's a huge multi-billion dollar industry. But actually getting you really well physically and mentally there's not a lot of profit in that. So if you really want to be healthy mentally and physically, I think there's ways to do this, which is getting to the root cause of what causes our health problems, whether they be physical or mental. And if it's a mental issue, I encourage you really check out, you can Google it, Neil Nedley, Depression Recovery, go through his stuff. It is phenomenal stuff. But one of the questions they ask, because there's actually a, a, sur a, a test you take, right? Kind of a survey a, a, where you self-evaluate, you know, you, you don't self-evaluate. You actually answer questions, and then they kind of rate you and determine your, your, your state of mental health based on this, this, uh, this questionnaire they ask. And I remember taking that, and one of the questions they ask is, do you routinely violate your conscience? Let that sink in. Do you routinely violate your conscience? Or in other words, are you living with cognitive dissonance? Do you think one thing is right, but you live another way? Now, do you think if people answer, yes, I routinely violate my conscience, do you think that lends itself to more positive or negative mental health? Obviously negative, okay? So cognitive dissonance, it's an issue. It's one we need to be aware of. And since most people are living functionally as atheists uh, but are actually theists, then I think it's important for us to work these issues out. When I was in my early 20s, I finally came to the idea that, you know, I actually I think I do believe in God but I don't live like there is no God. But I'm not totally sure there is a God. And so I should probably figure this out so that way I am uh, putting my life on the right trajectory. Because if there is no God, I don't need to be sort of pretending there is, like, you know, pretending there's a Santa Claus because it makes me feel good to see presents under the tree, but he really doesn't exist. It's mom and dad. You know, at some point you need to grow up and get over that. Maybe I shouldn't say that. Sorry, everybody. Maybe the kids aren't listening. But if they are, well, kids... There you go. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I'm speaking to the adults. Kids, just keep drawing about what I said. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Sometimes dissonance is bliss. You know? <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> but if God does exist, then that should have significant relevance in our life. Amen? And if he doesn't, that should have relevance. One way or the other, we should get it figured out what we believe and then live according to that. So it's therefore good to be clear on what we believe and to live that belief with intellectual and moral integrity. Intellectual integrity means being we're not believing in things that don't make any sense. 
we've actually thought through our worldview enough to know that there's some coherence to it. And then we're actually, the moral integrity part is we're actually living it out. So I have a question. What do you believe? What do you really believe? Do you believe in God? Do you believe he's a personal God or just an impersonal force? Do you believe in the Bible? Do you believe in Jesus that he rose from the grave? Like, what do you believe? And question, are you living out that belief? So, like I said, getting it right about what we believe, and that being true, because that's important. We, we, can, we can live out things that aren't true, and that's not going to be very helpful either. But if we are believing what is true, and then we're living that out, that seems to me to be a pretty good place to be. How about you? Amen? All right. So, all right, we're going to jump in our study guide now. And so, uh, Ty, Ty Gibson wrote these, by the way. Ty has us going here to Psalm chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. And this is quoting the psalm here. David writes, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? So he's looking out there at the, at the stars at night and saying, This is really big. This is huge. And God made all of this. So God is big. God is powerful. What is, what am I, just this little shepherd boy, that you would be mindful of me? Now, I want you to contrast this statement, okay? God is big, man is small, but God cares and is mindful of man. Contrast that with this statement by Protagoras, who was an ancient Greek philosopher. Don't these Greek philosophers, how many of these cool names? Like Protagoras. Man is the measure of all things. Well, that kind of makes man big, right? When this statement kind of makes man kind of small. Like, I look at how big things are. What is man? You're mindful of him. And Protagoras says, no, man is the measure of all things. So these, these competing worldviews aren't anything new. They've been around a long time. Okay. So which is it? Which is it? If we humans are mere animals, this is a quotation from your study guide. If we humans are mere animals, that has implications. What are those implications? Then a short life of animal urges and the finality of death are all we can legitimately hope for. Right? Well, let's just be real about the implications of this worldview. If humans are just material, we're just animals, then that, that's pretty much what we have to look forward to. Do your best now, because this is now all you have, and uh, experience as much pleasure and happiness as you can, because in the grave, it's, it's all not, not super hopeful, is it? Now, here's the other worldview. Theism, particularly from a biblical perspective. But if humanity was created in the image of God, then dignity, nobility, and eternal bliss may be ours. So the implications of all of this are very significant. So let's stay in Genesis for a second here. Genesis 1 and verse 27, it says, So God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God. He created them, male and female, he created them. So this statement obviously gives mankind dignity. We're made in the image of God. And the atheistic viewpoint, I think pretty clearly robs man of this dignity. We are essentially material. This is where we get the term materialism. I don't mean like materialism in the sense of like people buy too much at Christmas materialism. I'm talking about sort of philosophical materialism that says all that exists is matter. We're just material. And so if, a, if a, heaven forbid, a plane comes crashing down in here and incinerates all this, all this uh this organic matter, which is a nice way of saying you, every living thing in here, you are matter, you are organic, living matter. If a plane comes in here and just we totally go up literally in smoke, there's nothing left, then that's essentially materialism that just says we are just matter, and when matter disappears, that is the end of it. I don't see a whole lot of dignity uh, in that. And we see historically there's a lot of implications of this. So it's interesting that people say, you know, God died in the 19th century. That was Frederick Nietzsche who coined that phrase, God is, is dead and we have killed him, essentially saying that 
the modern man, and the, really as these philosophies really started to gel and come together about 150 years ago, that modern man essentially didn't need God anymore. So we have, we've essentially killed God in our own consciousness. So God is dead. The God is dead movement was, was really, you could say, started by Nietzsche. He's credited with this, but it's obviously bigger than just him. But You know, it's interesting. I think it was either Yale or Harvard. The Yale or Harvard Christian Society uh, printed these T-shirts that said, Nietzsche is dead. <laughs> that was kind of funny little play, right? God is dead. Actually, Nietzsche, you're the one that's been gone quite a while. He's still there. But, uh, yeah, God is, is, uh, is dead, and we have killed him. God died in the 19th century, and then man died in the 20th century. Isn't that interesting phenomenon? Philosophically, we do away with God in the 1900s. Then in the 20th century, we see the rise of these philosophies like Nazism that just says, you know what, we might as well just, our group might as well just take over everything and eliminate competing groups. Because if we're just, if we're just material, then what's wrong with that? I mean, that's how the animal world works, right? One species eliminates another species that's in competition for resources, and that species then thrives, and the other one goes away, and that's how you survive and thrive in a purely materialistic, naturalistic universe. Communism's another one. I mean, all these ideas, all these philosophies that are, that are there that I think have their root in these, this philosophical uh, chasm we might have between theism and atheism. So... Remember this illustration I gave you last week? What if you found a cell phone on the beach? You know, I Googled that. I just thought, I wonder if, like, I don't know, I just Google weird things sometimes. Finding a cell phone on the beach, and I found this guy. This is a metal detector. You ever seen those guys at the beach with a metal detector? Man, he hit the jackpot and found a cell phone. Actually, I don't know if that is the jackpot, because ethically you have to return it. And I don't even think you could even really use it, right? Can't you, like, lock them and all that kind of stuff? But he, with his metal detector, found a cell phone on the beach. Now, I want you to use your heads. Let's keep this pretty simple. I don't want to get real, real deep and philosophical with it. We did a four-part sermon series like last year or sometime where we went pretty deep into all this. I'm not going to rehash all that. I just want you to use common sense. Common sense solves a lot of problems. Do you believe that? It solves a lot of problems in our personal lives in our families, and churches, and whole nations, and societies, if we just kind of use our heads and just follow common sense and don't overcomplicate things, life will be much better. So you ready to apply some common sense here? All right. Let's see how common it is. Now, let's say concerning that iPhone right there. That's a pretty sophisticated piece of machinery, isn't it? You can do a lot of things you get lost, you can punch in the address. It'll take you where to go. I love that feature, don't you? That's the reason why I bought a smartphone. I was actually resisting the smartphone revolution about a decade ago, saying, eh, you know, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want one of those. Yeah, I got lost one time, and I went and went to Verizon and got me a smartphone. I said, I'm not letting that happen again. I drove around for like 30 minutes and know where I was going. Take pictures, right? Read the Bible. That's the reason you stay up late, by the way, if you have one of those. <laughs> Me too. Anyway, pretty sophisticated thing, isn't it? Question, what is more sophisticated, the functioning of you and your body and your mind and all of this or that phone? It's you. What about this entire cosmos? What about this world we live in? And the intricacies of all of this, that it's the right temperature for us. What if it was just a little bit, what if the world was further away from the sun and it was really cold? What if it was closer and really hot? What if the exact composition of what we're breathing and oxygen and so on, it, what, what if that wasn't tuned just right? So do you think this world is, is more complex than an iPhone? Definitely so. I mean, infinitely so. I don't even know how to put a number on it. Maybe a million times more complex this world is. More than that than just a little iPhone. So this guy, when he found an iPhone, do you think he said, wow, it is amazing that the natural processes of the ocean and the sand moving around over eons of time 
have created this amazing thing, and it just happens to be perfectly in time, by the way. The timing is great. Or do you think he said, wow, somebody designed a phone, somebody bought it, and I found it with my metal detector. Now let's apply common sense. Do you think it's the first one or the second one? It's obviously going to be the second one. Okay? This logic applies across the board, by the way. Uh, obviously, where we have creation, we will have a creator. Now, there's a statement I'll put up here. I, I don't want it to be an offensive statement. It's in the Bible. I'll give it some context as I put it up there. But Ty Gibson used it in the Bible study, and so I want to put it here and have it filled in. But I don't want to insult people. There are intelligent atheists. There, there are people who do not believe in God who are quite smart. It's actually quite fashionable in more intellectual circles to be atheist. doesn't mean it's true, of course. But it's fashionable. I don't want to be insulting to anybody. But since it's in your study guide, I'm going to put it up here. We'll fill it in, and then we'll talk about it in a minute, okay? So Psalm 14 and verse 1. Do you know this verse? Who knows what that says? Yeah, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Notice where it's said at. In the heart. It, it, it's more than just an intellectual decision. Now, this text, I don't think, is meant to be a demeaning jab at atheist but rather a ra rational observation regarding the logical incoherence of atheism or atheism. There is no, no God. Ty Gibson uses an, an interesting argument <coughs> that I hadn't actually read before. If I had read before, I hadn't remembered it in your study guide. I'll share this argument with you. It, it, it's an interesting one. It's more philosophical than, than anything, but it's, it's something to think about. There is nothing that exists in the human imagination that does not have some basis in reality. Okay, let me say that again, and then I'll unpack that a little bit. There is nothing that exists in the human imagination that does not have some basis in reality. So unicorns, do they exist, yes or no? No, they don't. But is, does it have some basis in reality? Yeah, there are horses. There are rhinos, so to have a little white horse with a rainbow behind it, you know, with a little horn coming out of its nose, that has some basis in reality, doesn't it? Now, do space aliens riding around on spaceships who are going to land here and come out and say, take me to your leader, do they exist? You know, I'm not even going to ask that question if they exist. Let's not even go there. We're not going to have a big debate on this. I went to Roswell, New Mexico one time when I was like in my, I don't know, I was like 20 years old or so, and there's like a whole alien industry there of like people going, <laughs> and these little Martians running around and whatnot. Now, is there some basis of reality of that? Yeah, I mean, there's things that exist. Maybe they don't, you know, it's interesting those little Martians look like us, right? Like, like they're green. I mean, we're not green, but green exists, and they have little like antennas on their head. You know what's interesting too about that? You know, in the 1950s when all this stuff got popular, um, it's interesting that you needed, like, antennas to, like, communicate. And so all these people going, I saw aliens, and they happen to have, like, 1950s-style antennas on the top of their head. It's just kind of interesting, isn't it, you know? And they fly in flying saucers. Why don't we have, like, 400 years ago people drawing pictures of flying saucers? Let that sink in for a while. Because there were no flying objects. It, it, it didn't exist like a flying object, like humans flying around in something. So it didn't exist in the imagination. So once humans start building planes and ships and flying around, then we start imagining that people are flying around in outer space, but they're little green creatures. But you see what I'm saying? Everything, ha everything we imagine has some basis in reality. Think of every made-up fictional thing, like mermaids. Woohoo! mermaids swimming in the ocean. Do they exist? They do not. But do things in the ocean that have big tails exist? Yes. Do women exist? Yeah. And I'm sure when you're a lonely sailor out at sea, you can find a way to imagine those two coming together in some kind of weird way, right? You see, it all has some kind of basis in reality. And so Ty makes this argument that God exists in our imaginations, in our minds, not in our imagination like it's made up, but God exists in our minds, and there's nothing that exists in our minds that does not have some basis in reality. It's an interesting argument. So, 
why are people opposed to the idea of God's existence? I think there's two good reasons for that. One kind of blames us on some level, collectively as a whole. The other more is an individual reason. So here's, I think, a pretty good reason why people ex- you know, don't believe in God. The awful picture of God that most religions, including Christianity, have given people. Now, I need to define what I mean by Christianity. I, I don't necessarily mean the truth. <laughs> Obviously, I'm a Christian. You don't have to ha- call a meeting and fire me. I'm a Christian. Like the pastor's up here saying what we believe is terrible. No, 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 no. What, what I'm saying is the picture of Christianity that has been given for a long time and the image of God that it has presented to people is not a very flattering picture, I would say. Would you agree with that? Yeah. All right, good. Because it hasn't. It, it's, it's not. You know, and I won't get into examples of that. We'll do that later in the study, okay? The other one is moral accountability. You know, I think it was Thomas. It was one of the Huxleys. The Huxleys are kind of a famous group of generational atheists from Britain who've, like, made atheism like a a family business. There's, like, three or four generations of them that have written all these books about atheism and whatnot. And one of the, I think it was one of the, maybe even the patriarch of, of it, one of the Huxleys, who said, I wanted there to be no meaning. I wanted there to be no God so that I could live out my own sexual desires without any accountability whatsoever. So in other words, he wanted to do away with dissonance, you see? So if you believe in God, and like in that society then, especially in, 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 in 19th century Britain, people believed in God, generally speaking. And so he wanted to live like there was no God, but didn't like the dissonance. So then you have to, in order to, to close the gap of that dissonance, you either have to get rid of God or get rid of your immoral lifestyle. So he said, actually, we can get rid of God, and then I can live as I please, and I don't have to live with this dissonance that I'm really not living out what I think to be true. So that's part of it, this the moral accountability element there. And also, I think this is, is, is pretty significant, too. If you've talked to atheists, whatnot, <coughs> they'll point to this kind of stuff out. Which, what I say when I meet people like this and we talk, they say, I don't believe in God because this, they start naming all these negative characteristics. I say, you know what, I'm an atheist too as it relates to that kind of God. I I don't believe in the God you're imagining. So many ask, if God exists and is powerful and good, then why is there evil in the world? That's a pretty good question, don't you think? Because that does seem to have a little bit of logical contradiction here. So let's assume God does exist. And let's assume he's powerful, because obviously a, a God that's not powerful, that, that, that can't make anything happen. Yeah. No, let's assume he's powerful. He's omnipotent, meaning he can do anything. And he's also good. He's moral and he's good. If he's powerful and he's good, well, then why is there all this bad stuff going on in the world? Well, let's go back a, a level and look at that question. So when God chose to create mankind, he had only three possibilities. One is he could have made us machines, like that phone. I can, I don't know if this would work or not, but let me try. Suri, tell me every morning that you love me. Suri doesn't get it. But you know what? I think the technology exists, don't you? Just, just the right coding. And uh, Suri could be programmed to say, I love you, Blake, every morning, right? Now, would that make me feel good? I love you too, Suri. Thank you. It's just a machine. It's a machine. You can program, you can program and say whatever you want it to say, right? So God could have made us machines. That's one option. Number two, he could have made us just slaves where we do have free will, but we're not allowed to exercise it. You know, that's kind of like the old picture of like, uh, you know, caveman with, with, with the woman dragging her by the hair. Hey, tell me you love me. Well, I guess I will. So you don't whack me with that stick. Right. I mean, so God could have made us that way, could have made us slaves, but that's not going to work out too well either. 
And he had a third option. He could make us free moral agents with the ability to choose. Now, since God is love, let me go here. God is love, 1 John 4.16, God has to create us to be free moral beings because only free beings can give and therefore truly receive love. You see that? That's, that's a very important point there on this. You see, if we're just robots, there's no love involved with that. There's no choice. If we're slaves, there's no love involved with that. There's no choice. It's only where there is choice can there be love. There has to be freedom for it to exist. Now, the world's brokenness is caused by mankind's irresponsible use of freedom. Let that one sink in, guys. This is an important point to make here. It's not God's fault. It's actually our fault. It's humanity's fault that the world is messed up. It's not His. But now God is still ultimately responsible on some level because He created us and created all this. So God doesn't say, well, I told you not to do that. You did it anyway, so there you go. Ain't my fault. I'm going to go to some other part of the universe while you all just wreck yourselves. No, God is love. Just like if your children get themselves in a jam, you don't go, well, <laughs> figure it out. Unless it's, I mean, if it's a minor jam, you may say that. But in a serious jam, like you're going to die jam, you don't go, well, too bad. You know, next time you'll learn not to do that. Oh, there won't be a next time. You know what I'm saying? You, obviously, we're not going to do that. Okay. God's got a plan to fix all this. And we'll just summarize the plan. It's real simple, and we'll unpack it more in these studies, and it is profound, it is beautiful, it is powerful. It is, it is absolutely life, not just even life transformational, it is self-transformational, how amazing it is. But here's God's plan. God will come to earth as a human being. He'll show us what love and righteousness really look like. He'll be the example of it. And then... He invites us to accept that example, which is Jesus, to learn Jesus' ways, and then we don't want that dissonance. Once we learn, what do we need to do? Come on, don't be a dead church. Once we learn, what do we need to do? Walk in His ways and be, and as we do that, as we accept Jesus, learn of Jesus, walk in His ways, what happens? We are restored to authentic humanity. You see, this experience that we're living now in this flesh, in this world, this is not how God designed it. This is not authentic humanity. It's distorted humanity. Jesus came to give us a picture of what true, authentic humanity as designed by God looks like. And then he says, follow me. And as we do that, we then are progressively restored into the image of authentic humanity that God created. That's called the gospel. That's good news. And I think it's what the world needs to hear. Don't you, church family? All right. Let's do it. It's very simple. What do we need to do? Follow Jesus, behold Jesus, trust Jesus, in other words, have faith, and then live that out, live out that faith by following him it is that simple, and then we're restored into the image of God. So I want to invite our musicians to come forward. We will sing a wonderful hymn, How Great Thou Art. And then I'll close out with prayer. And then by the grace of God, we'll restore humanity by y'all waiting till I can get to the door. And I can high five you, knuckle bump you, and shake hands, whatever your preference is. In all seriousness, isn't this good? I think this is a beautiful thing that God is willing to change us. And he'll accept us as we are. That's the good thing. We can come to him as an absolute total mess. 
And he said, the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast away. Isn't that good news? You can be a total train wreck of a person. Let's face it, you are a total train wreck of a person, and I am too compared to Jesus. Now, I may look at my neighbor and say, his train's a lot bigger than mine, right? My wreck's kind of minor compared to his. His wreck is all over the place, right? International news, his train wreck. My train wreck is more local news, right? We're all a train wreck on some level. How big it is or how small it is, we need God to help us with this. No matter how big or how small it is, God is willing to help us with this. We just have to come to Him, walk with Jesus, learn His ways, follow in His ways, and Jesus will get the job done. He will finish the work He began in us. Isn't that a beautiful message? And God is good. All right, he's an amazing God. Let's all stand and let's sing How Great Thou Art.
you know, I'll be out there shaking hands, and uh, if you want to talk to me, feel free to talk to me, okay? If you want to talk about, I mean, of course, we can talk about anything, right? But what I'm especially appealing toward is if you really want to follow Jesus, you want to know what it means to follow Jesus, you want to be baptized, you want to explore the idea of being baptized, you want to study the Bible, you want to learn more, you want a deeper experience of God, um, we can help you with that. And so mention that to me, or you can write your name and your number down and just give me your name and number, and I'll give you a call, and we'll talk about it. But I don't want you to hear a message and be convicted and not take action. It's important to take action when God convicts us. And so if God is speaking to anyone's heart here today in a special way or just any way, period, and you want some guidance in that, let me know. Okay, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your great love for us, God. Thank you for giving us the perfect pattern in Jesus. Thank you that though we have failed miserably of following that perfect pattern, every last one of us, that your love for us is unchanging, that you have compassion for us. You want to save us from the vices that will tear us down and bring us down. Thank you for being such a friend and such a God and such a Savior and a King. I pray for each one of us here to really surrender all to Jesus, to know Him, to study Him, and to follow Him with undivided hearts. And we ask in His wonderful name, amen.